Okay. Okay, well, welcome everybody to the second day of our annual Hicksa Talks. Um, we're so happy to be here this year with you guys online. Um, and as most of you guys know, we are the Hispanic Graduate Student Association. Um, and it's just a, a group of graduate students here at FSU that, um, oh, let me my music. <laughs> it's a group of graduate students here at F FSU um, that want to promote Hispanic culture and build a network uh, of support and mentors. Um, and uh, yeah, so I'm gonna, so uh, for the presenters that are already here, you guys will have co-host privileges um, while you're presenting which means that um, you can admit people from the waiting room, but we have someone um, who is assigned to that task. So don't worry about admitting people. Um, and also, unless you're presenting or asking a question, we ask that you guys go ahead and keep yourself muted um, so as not to interrupt our speakers. And with that, I'm gonna hand it over to our president, Louise, who will introduce our first keynote speaker, Dr. Lopez. Thank you, Susan. Thank you, Susan. Good morning, family. Uh, we are so glad of being part of your breakfast today, this beautiful and sunny morning in Tallahassee. Um, it is with great pleasure that I want to introduce to our third keynote speaker of this Hicksa Talks, Dr. Jorge Lopez. Um, we were just remembering that we started conversations to have him in our event one year ago. Uh, Yes, it is great that we uh, finally do it. You are gonna allow me to read this, um, this introduction. I don't wanna miss any piece of it. Uh, Dr. Lopez is the Schumacher Professor in the Department of Physics at the University of Texas at El Paso. His research areas include nuclear physics, gravity wave, astrophysics, physics education, pre-K science teaching, material science and application of scientific method to social science, including political science, anthropology, and cultural heritage. Throughout his career, Dr. Lopez has been a leader in outreach activities, especially those favoring Hispanics. In 1993, he was the chair of the Committee on Minorities of the American Physical Society. From 1993 to 1995, he created the NASA Physics Centers in six El Paso area high schools. Also, I wanna highlight that he has played a key role initiating the National Society of Hispanic Physicists, the Latin America Symposium on Nuclear Physics and Application, and in founding the Division of Radiation Physics of the Mexican Society of Physics. With that said, I just, we are just ready for you, Dr. Lopez, the floor oh, is yours. Oh, thank you, yours. thank you. Um, I wanted to, first I want to show a little bit of, um, a little bit of, of, of where we are, a little bit of uh, my university. Uh, you should be seeing uh, the, the first slide of my presentation. Let me just double check. Yeah. Yeah, we see it. And on the little screen, you should be seeing me. Is that right? That's right. Okay. Yeah, yeah well, um, I want to thank uh, the organizers for the hard work that they do. This is uh, an incredible um, enterprise. It takes a lot of time and uh, resources. But um, also the benefits are great because um, you're putting together a lot of... Um, uh, graduate students and sharing experiences across disciplines. And this is uh, one of the, the, the first concern that I had. What can I tell, what can I tell the uh, graduate students that are not in physics? Usually when, when I talk to undergrads, I can, I can tell them uh, easily not to study physics. And if I manage to convince them, then I'm sure that they were not ready to study physics. So that's uh, an easy message for me to deliver. But once that uh, you're in grad school, well, you're not interested in physics, you're interested in whatever you're studying. So um, what can I say that is of uh, interest to you guys? I can, you know, 
kind of emulate uh, the keynote speaker of uh, yesterday and talk about uh, something interesting in my field, like she did. But um, there's nothing interesting in my field. My field is boring because it's, uh, you know, it, it requires so much math, so much uh, computers that uh, in order to uh, see something of um, something that can, you know, you, you can say, oh, wow, you need to know, you know, you need to be in the field. That's uh, no other choice. So I, I thought that um, maybe what I can do is um, talk more about uh, other types of experiences that are related to the career. These are not uh, specific to physics, but um, they, they, nevertheless, they are um, very interesting. Turns out that uh, when you're a professor, uh, just because you're here in the university and um, spending time um, in, in this public place, uh, you get a, a lot of uh, requests that are unusual, to say the least. One day, somebody knocked on my door, and then uh, he said that uh, he was uh, running away from a nuclear explosion, that uh, he was on his way from Houston to California to save his uh, spirit. And I wonder why would anybody like that come to me? Well, because, um, you know, I'm a nuclear physicist. So they wanted me, they want to talk to me about it. Of course, uh, this, uh, this person had mental problems, but uh, another time there was another person that came to me and told me that uh, he had a compadre in Durango that uh, had invented some sort of a machine and now the Mexican government was after him to steal the machine and he wanted to bring it to the United States. And they wanted me to give this person a letter so that they would allow him to cross the border and, and so that he can come and talk to me. And I, well, I can do that of course, but um, you know, this type of requests, uh, you might think that they are weird, but they are very common. They, they, it, they have, it happens to many professors in, uh, in their different fields. So it turns out that um, through the years, I've been here, you know, many decades, um, I, I received um, or I got involved in some of these uh, uh, stories and I decided to put them together and to write a, a booklet on them. And so I, I thought that maybe I can just tell you uh, one or two of these uh, stories that might be fun. But before that, let me let me see if I can um, show my advance my slides. And with that, um, this is my university. We are on the border with uh, Mexico. Actually, we are just one freeway away from the border. I had a student that uh, used to live in Mexico on the other side of uh, the, he used to cross the river illegally to, because it was much easier to come straight from his house to the university than to go around to, <laughs> but those were the days. Uh, and um, look at all these pictures, look at the architecture and compared to one slide that is about to be, that one <laughs> was too fast. Um, the one that I uh, pointed at is um, in, in, um, in Nepal, Nepal? Yeah, it's uh, in one of those places far away, far away. Well, the architecture was um, decided to be that way because of uh, somebody thought it that would look nice in this area, but uh, it has nothing to do with the, you know, the usual uh, architecture of the area. Well, we have uh, here El Paso and all the way to the other end of the United States where you are, where some of you are, because uh, many of you are connected uh, from other places, Tallahassee. And if I were to drive, it would take me 22 hours. Now, uh, this area here, El Paso, the name comes from El Paso del Norte. That, that used to be the, uh, the name of the Mexican city. 
but the Mexican city changed its name to Juarez, Ciudad Juarez. So now we, in, in El Paso, that was used, used to be called Franklin at the, initially, uh, changed its name to El Paso. And that happened, uh, th this is, um, it's hard to see it, but El Paso del Norte is right here. You can see it on the, on the, the star there. And all of this region, I, I, I call it El Paso del Norte because it is tied with respect to its, um, uh, oh, oh, I went to one too many. It is tied with respect to its uh, history. Oh, here, okay, here we go. So this is, um, I'm, point, I'm studying uh, the area here in Santa Barbara, Chihuahua, and I'm, I'm going all the way to Santa Fe, on all the way to the top, Santa Fe, New Mexico. This, um, I, I start in Santa Barbara because uh, that's where the Spaniards, that's the frontier of uh, the, the Spaniards in the 1500s. They had uh, mines there, they were extracting minerals and, um, at some point, they requested permission uh, to the Viceroyalty in Mexico to advance to the north. And because of that, this region here has always been uh, a region of um, cultural uh, encounters, different cultures encountering each other. First, the Spaniards and the natives, and then the Mexicans that develop its own culture by mixing, you know, the native uh, natives of Mexico with the Spaniards, and then uh, the Anglo's, and all of this has caused a lot of uh, uh, interesting situations, to say the least. I don't know if interesting is the word, but um, but but uh, I'm going to talk about some of those. Um, circumstances. If you look at this slide, um, um, I'm talking about two words here, uh, science and El Paso del Norte. Science is not an accumulation of knowledge li like uh, it is commonly believed. Science is a method of thinking. It's uh, a method that allows you to uh, gather your um, evidence and then think about it to construct some sort of um, model that fits the evidence and then try to explain it that way. And uh, once that you go around and try to explain it and it doesn't fit, then you go and, and modify your initial hypothesis. But it's a way of thinking and it has nothing to do with science per se. Uh, we associate science with chemistry, biology, physics and all of that. But in fact, uh, this way of thinking is, uh, applicable to just about any other area. You can use it, you know, to uh, clean your house. Just think about it. Oh, you have to clean, you know, the stairs from the top to the bottom because otherwise it gets more difficult. And it, yeah, it's just a matter of looking at the evidence and making a decision. So it's supposed to, this method of thinking is supposed to help us. But uh, it turns out that when you have uh, evidence that you don't quite know how to process because of your cultural upbringing, then uh, you end up having this type of uh, situation. And El Paso del Norte is one of those regions. It's a region that uh, under I uh, ideal uh, circumstances would have been a melting pot. And that melting pot is the one that brings, you know, the best of the best of the different cultures. And you end up with a culture that is even better. But uh, in fact, what, what we have seen in uh, many occasions is that uh, it, when you get those ideas from diff different cultures, you just mix them and you just crush them like you, you would be putting chiles and tomates in, in one of these uh, the objects here that uh, in Mexico we call the molcajete. So that's um, what, I, what I see happening. So I have a, a series of stories that I, I won't have time to touch on all of them, but I, at least I want to tell you about two. If you, if we have time, you can ask me about the rest. 
But all of these are things that have happened in um, here. The, the one on top is just an introduction to the subject. It happened many years ago. It had nothing to do with me. But uh, the rest are somehow, I even been uh, an actor you know, in some of those, or I have been uh, uh, a witness, or I've been close to the people involved in, the, in these um, uh, events. So let me, let me first uh, start by talking about the, um, the first death in El Camino Real. Uh, it turns out that, um, oh, I went too far. Uh, it turns out that in 1581, you know, the Spaniards decided to come north. And uh, in doing so, they gather a, a large group of people and large, you know, not, too, not that large, uh, but uh, they, they, they had uh, Fray Agustin Rodriguez and they had Francisco Lopez, the Franciscans, and uh, Juan de Santa Maria, he, this guy was from Catalonia, from Spain. And they were also guarded by uh, nine soldiers that were under the, the orders of uh, Sanchez Chamuscado. And, and also on top of that, they had servants, you know, Mexicans that uh, they were bringing, 19 of them, and 600 head of cattle. So they, they departure from uh, Santa Barbara, and then they follow the Rio Conchos. The Rio Conchos goes like, you know, into mid-Texas, Coahuila, and then they, they, it, it joins the Rio Grande del Norte. And at that point, they turn left and continue through the Rio Grande up, up west and then north. So they went through this region, through El Paso del Norte, and they went up all the way to the plains in uh, Albuquerque and uh, Santa Fe. They ended up uh, reaching um, Santa Fe. But in doing so, they found the, the culture there. They found that there was a lot of activity, a lot of natives, a lot of people that, uh, that they were afraid of God, according to the words of uh, the Hernán Gallego, which was the chronicler. And he said that, that they were afraid of God because they would cover their uh, bodies with clothes. They were not naked like many of the many other natives. And they wore shoes and they had houses and the houses had walls. And there was a, one house on top of another house and so on. So it was a, a very advanced um, uh, culture. So when they got there, they saw so many people that they got extremely excited because they were... Uh, you know, this was a religious adventure. It was not a military adventure. So they, they, they said, oh, we're going to need more help to, uh, you know, turn all of these guys into Christians. And um, so what, what happened was that there was a guy, one of the Franciscans, Juan de Santa Maria, who volunteered. He said, oh, I'll go back. I'll go back by myself all the way to... Um, to uh, Santa Barbara and tell them that uh, there's a lot of activity here and we need uh, reinforcements. We need more priests to come and help us with this uh, campaign. So uh, they said, well, can you, can you make it back? Do you know how to go back? I said, yeah, sure. Yeah, I know. Especially because I know how to read the stars. Well, which means you can orient yourself with the stars, which it was, you know, in terms of the, of the era, it was extremely advanced. And not only that, not, not all, it was part of science. Anyway, so he left Santa Barbara. I mean, he left uh, Santa Fe and began going south. Uh, initially, it's very simple because you just follow the river. There is nothing to, to worry about. You don't get lost. But at some point, the river goes through mountains. And this is the so-called, um, uh, what, what is the name of this? Uh, Camino del Muerto, and the, because you have to, the river goes through the mountains and you have to grow, go through the desert, and which is difficult. And so, but from the time that he left Santa Fe, uh, some natives began following him. He realized that he was being followed. He was being followed by people from, um, 
people from the work, town of Tano, the Tano Indians. And um, at some point, he had to, you know, instead of following the river, he had to move away from the river and began orienting himself by looking at the stars. And he can, continued doing that, you know, especially he had to travel in the night because uh, that's how you see the stars. And everything went okay, except that he disappeared. You know, for the longest time, it was not known what had happened to him. But uh, turns out that um, this uh, archeologist, Bandelier, he, he studied the, the, um, uh, the situation and he concluded the following. He said, well, when um, Santa Maria was uh, watching the stars, he was insulting the Indians, the Tano natives. Why? Because the Tano natives had, they had forbidden, they were forbidden to look at the sky because it was like looking at God and, and it was irreverent. So, and when he kept doing that, they were convinced that he was uh, a sorcerer. And, well, you know, the, the Tano natives had the mandate of uh, killing all the sorcerers. And they capture him and they squash his head with a big rock. And this is what uh, Bandelier found decades ago. So, uh, he was the first scientist, quote unquote, that uh, died in the Paso del Norte region. Why? Because of a cultural shock. What he was doing was not appreciated by the observers and that produced the, the problem. So um, it is kind of the same uh, theme all over. Uh, the next story that I'm gonna tell you also shows uh, an encounter of something very advanced with uh, even something extremely uh, old way of thinking and that caused uh, an interesting situation. You can ask me questions at any time. So I'm gonna talk about a special trash in Mapimi. And the first word had reference to space, to satellites. Well, I need to tell you where Mapimi is. It's a little bit south of Santa Barbara. And um, turns out that uh, what happened was that all of a sudden you had a clear sky in uh, Mapimi and something fell from the sky. And well, weeks later, my phone rang. And that's how the story began. Somebody asking for a professor that would speak Spanish. And this is how I got involved. Okay, what happened here was the following. Um, I have this, uh, these notes in Spanish because they are, sounds more poetic. They were, there was uh, Mr. Altamirano and his compadre and his son you know, just relaxing and at the end of the day, looking at the, at the horizon with all those wonderful colors that we have here on, on sunsets in the uh, desert. And all of a sudden they saw, uh, you know, a flash of light coming down, filling the, the sky with different colors and yellows and reds. And so, wow, that thing fell, not that far from them, but, and then Mr. Altamirano said, hey, Look at that. What do you think it was? And then compadre said, I don't know. And Mr. Altamirano said to his son, son, go and get it and bring it. <laughs> so the, the little kid went running, you know, like two miles all the way to the, to the object and then came back all sweaty. He said, uh, it's a ball, pa. What do you mean a bowl? Yeah, it's a bowl, it's round, it's a bowl made out of metal. And then why didn't you bring it? Well, it's too heavy. I can I couldn't bring it. Oh, okay, let's uh, all of us go. So they went, you know, not running, crushing the the dirt under under them because it was so dry uh 
towards the end of the summer. They got there and they say, hey, look, nothing happened to it. It's still round. Yeah. Uh, but it got burned on this side. And look at this. It has a nipple here. What do you think it was? I don't know. Could it be from the Martians? Well, you know, I don't know, but I'm going to keep it. What do you mean, compadre, you're going to keep it? Yeah, I'm going to take it home. I'm going to cut it, and I'm going to make, a, a, you know, a place for water for the cows. So, <laughs> and say, oh, okay. Well, and all, all three of them began rolling it and taking turns and rolling it. And they take, took it all the way to the house. It was a small adobe house. They had a small farm. And then um, he said, hey, mijo, go and get water for us and uh, bring the hose to clean this thing up. So he did that. And then the Mrs. Altamirano came out to say, what? More garbage? You're bringing more of your junk? He said, no, no. Uh, this one fell from the sky. So I don't care. <laughs> you get rid of that. And then the compadre said, I can take it. I said, no, no, wait, 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 wait. And then Mrs. Altamira said, Who who saw it first? He said, Your your husband. Then belongs to him. You you keep it. <laughs> okay. So uh, Mr. Altamirano said, you know, I'm gonna push it inside the house because I don't want it to be uh for the ball to be out here. Because if somebody comes looking for it, uh they're gonna take it from us. So they roll it inside to the bedroom. And then uh, it was there when uh, the daughter of the Altamiranos showed up. Uh, she lives here in El Paso, outside El Paso in a small town called Socorro. But turns out that uh, she was, um, her business was to go all the way to Moroleon in Guanajuato, the state of Guanajuato, to buy sweaters and, you know, uh, how do you call that, uh, bed spreads, things, you know, clothing and things like that. And he would buy a bunch and then bring them to El Paso and sell them here. So that was her business. And she was on her uh, mid-20s. So um, she goes there and so sees the, the ball inside of the, of the bedroom and says, what is this thing doing here? So, oh, your father... And then they say, well, is it not dangerous? Is it not leaking something? Is it not radioactive? How do you know? And mom, you're pregnant. How can you have this thing next, next, next to your uh, bed? And then, well, tell your father. So she tells uh, the father instead of the father, no, nothing's going to keep it. Uh, uh, it's going to take it away from me. Give me one of your blankets. I'm going to cover it with one. Is it loco, papa? <laughs> I'm going to investigate to see what is uh, what is this thing, uh, so that uh, you you don't put your uh, my mom at, at risk. So he she comes back to El Paso, and of course, what does she do? Phones me, and so um, this is uh, I had pictures of it, but unfortunately, as, as I will tell you, I I, I never got them back from. Uh, the jet propulsion lab, but um, this is uh, similar to, to that. By the way, there have been many events like this across the world, but nowadays it's more fashionable. They, you can even buy these balls uh, in eBay, 540 bucks, I think, there's uh, the price of one of those. Um, so the, turns out that, um, she comes back to El Paso and uh, she phones me. And I, I said, well, um, I don't know if, you, if you're familiar with uh, the, the way that uh, people tend to speak here in the North. They don't respect much the structure of words. They switch the, the verb and the, the complement of, the, of, of a phrase and they tend to give more explanations than needed. So what this person was doing, he began, she began telling me about all the products that she had brought from Amor Leon. And she asked me if I had a daughter that, uh, because she had this uh, not very nice sweaters for, you know, uh, little babies. And uh, 
so at some point I stopped her and said, well, wait, 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 what do you want from me? And she, well, what I want is for you to tell me what to do with that ball. I said, well, first I need to see the, uh, the pictures after half an hour. So I, I ended up going to Socorro, to her house. And it was, it was a bizarre experience because uh, she was living with her father-in-law and uh, the husband. And the father-in-law welcomed me to the, you know, the very uh, humble uh, house. And he began to explain to me that in that region of, uh, in Mapimi, in that region, which is known as the uh, silent, silent zone, la zona del silencio, because people say that, um, you know, radio waves don't transmit there, which is not true. But anyway, this is what they say. So uh, they say, you know, many weird things happen there. I've seen, I've seen uh, uh, like rods that fell from the sky and then you see them and boom, they fly just next to you. And you have to be, uh, you know, keeping a, an eye on those because you're walking and all of a sudden, wow, they, they run by you. Uh, of course, um, I wouldn't believe any of that. But anyway, so they were telling me all those stories and they showed me the, the pictures and I took the pictures um, to my office. And what do, I, uh, what do you do with that? Well, at the time I was doing a study of uh, uh, gravity waves. We were looking for gravity waves that eventually were discovered like uh, 20 years later. And I was working with Jon Anderson from the Jet Propulsion Lab. And you know the Jet Propulsion Lab is uh, associated with Caltech and is funded by NASA. And I, I had a, a grant from them. And so I sent everything, uh, a, a fax. I sent a fax to John Anderson, imagine a fax. And with uh, you know, a scanned picture of, uh, of, of the pictures. And he said, well, Jorge, I don't know what to tell you. I have no clue about this. And um, so what I can recommend is that you talk to uh, Aerospace Corporation. And um, Aerospace Corporation, oh, because we talk about it, uh, it had some uh, in inscription, in inscription on the side, the ball. It said critical 108 N54 spin forge PN uh, 1098. So that um, the, I said, well, I, let me get you connected with people at the uh, Aerospace Corporation. Aerospace Corporation, they do uh, just about anything, uh, everything that in, in, in uh, space uh, technology. But um, when I talked to the first guy there, uh, George uh, Chelsea, he said, well, for the size, looking at the size, it could be uh, one of the old Sputniks. I said, what? But he has words in English. I said, well, you know, those sneaky Russians, they can, they can put words in English so that if anything happens with that thing, when it fails, uh, we don't blame them. So, oh, I see. And I said, well, but uh, how is that the, these things fall from the sky? So, well, you know, all the satellites that are in orbit, they are in free fall. Eventually everything's gonna come down. Remember the sky lab? You know, ah, okay. So um, the, he said, but there's not much I can do with, uh, uh-oh, uh-oh, what am I doing? There's not much I can do with, um, with the faxes. I need to, I need the picture. So I sent the actual pictures to, to Chelsea, who passed them to Debbie, Debbie uh, Nero. And Debbie, uh, weeks later, she, she phoned me and said, uh, Dr. Lopez, I have some news. It's not a satellite, it's a fuel tank. And probably, it's from one of the rockets that come out of Vanderbilt, I mean Vanderburg in, uh, in California. As they enter orbit, they, get, they have to be accommodated, lifted by means of these uh, smaller fuel tanks. And then they release the tanks and they tend to fall in that uh, in the, the area. And the thing is that they are made of titanium. So even if they want to cut it, they won't be able to cut them. So don't worry. Tell them not to worry about, about that. And they will not leak anything. So that was, uh, for me, that was the end of the story. If you look in uh, internet now, you can find those titanium spheres. And look at the price, $525. It's 
it's a good price for a metal bowl. But um, anyway, so um, as the story goes, we were um, at some point I was uh, with Dr. Clarence Cooper, who you would never imagine he's, um, he's Mexican. He was born in Mexico, Dr. Clarence Cooper. Uh, he was born in Durango. And he uh, gets invited to go to the Tecnológico de Durango often. He re he's retired now, but uh, the time. So we went there once. And on the, the way back from, from Durango, we were dr driving by Ceballos. Ceballos, for some reason, they put the ajiote on their uh, meat. Ajiote is that red thing. Like for instance, uh, cheddar cheese, the yellow one, the orange one, has a, a chiote in it. Well, they use that uh, stuff to put it on, on meat and on uh, chicken, and they are famous for that. So we were driving and uh, Dr. Cooper said, um, well, why don't we stop here to have some tacos? They're very good here uh, in this area. So we stopped at this place called, uh, it's a, it was just, a, you know, um, uh, not, not even a, a, it was a stand, it was not even a truck at the time. And um, it was called uh, the satellite. So we stopped and then uh, uh, Cooper ordered uh, some tacos. And then he looked at the, the pan, the, the, the kind of like a wok that this guy was using to fry the food and asked him, hey, uh, this is an, uh, a nice asador. Uh, where do you get it? Said, well, you won't believe this, but it fell from the sky. So what? Yeah, what's well, just my luck? I got it. That's how I got it. God sent it to me. I said, oh, that's that's weird. Yeah. And then asked me, uh, Jorge, do you want some tacos? I said, no, I'm not hungry. <laughs> And that was the end of the story. <laughs> um, was something like that. <laughs> well, unless you have questions, I can continue with my second uh, talk. How am I doing on time? Okay, I'll go fast. I had a question. Sure. Do you think that bowl added a certain flavor to it or the satellite? <laughs> no, I don't think so. Okay. Just curious. <laughs> I don't think so. Certain toxicity, maybe? What? Toxicity. Uh, well, the fuel is toxic, yes, but not if you clean it real well. <laughs> um, well, let me let me tell you a little bit about uh, what happened in Santa Fe. It um, it all began with a, a telephone call again, and turns out that uh, this time it was a friend of mine who phoned me. Um, we. We um, knew each other from when we were teenagers, and especially I was, uh, I mean, he was a teenager. I was in my 20s. I'm older than him. But then he went to Mexico City to study architecture or uh, civil engineering, and I went to uh, Texas A&M for my PhD in physics. So we crossed paths years later, and he was living in uh, San Diego, uh, working uh, with a construction company and investors in uh, Mexico, in, in Tijuana. And um, so he knew that I was a scientist. And um, when we crossed paths back then, the, you know, in the like 2010 or nine, um, he asked me about something weird that was, uh, they were doing. They had uh, water filters. And they, they, he explained to me that uh, the water filter, there was a water filter that had been developed by his brother-in-law. He was invented by his brother-in-law. And I have a picture of the brother-in-law here. Uh-oh, too fast.
This is the brother-in-law, which in Spanish we call it uh, Ciro Peraloca, but in English is uh, Jaro Girlus. And um, he said, well, um, turns out that um, those filters, they didn't have any moving part. They didn't, have, they didn't use any chemicals, no power, no batteries, no nothing. But uh, they were supposed to be cleaning, uh, disinfecting, and doing just about anything that uh, had to be done to water. They, this filter was doing it. So it was um, an impressive device. And when I saw it open, it had nothing inside. It was just a, you know, a twisted pipe. And I said, well, okay, you know, if you can make money out of that, it's uh, good for you, but I just don't see how this would work. And so they, he said, when he phoned me, he said, hey, remember the filters? I said, yeah, sure. Well, now we have another invention and we're gonna invest a lot of money. Okay, what is it? Oh, it's a, a, a magical electric motor. An electric motor? Magical? Well, it's a more like a generator. It generates power. It generates so much power that it can power itself and still produce extra for, you know, whatever you want to use it for light bulbs or is it free energy. Yes, yeah, he said. Well, I realized that it was, you know, it can be done. Of course, there is a law against the... Uh, creation of energy, a spontaneous creation of energy, this law is the, the so-called conservation of energy law. So I knew that it was uh, something wrong. I said, but we want to hire you as a consultant. We want you to uh, come with us and we're going to fly you to Santa Fe. We're going to feed you good food. We're going to put you in a nice hotel and you're going to examine what uh, uh, we're doing in this uh, lab. And you're going to tell us if you think it's, uh, it's a good idea to invest. And so, oh, well, okay. Well, let me show you. This is not exactly the same model, but it's kind of li like it. And it doesn't have anything inside. This is for the water. It doesn't have anything inside. But uh, it's supposed to do uh, all of that. Well, this is my, my friend. This is one of the investors. And there was a third one. They were ready to cough up uh, $5.5 million on this investment. Well, turns out that um, we were gonna go from El Paso all the way to Santa Fe. And a week later, we ended up driving my van with me paying the gas. And they, they're not uh, paying me anything for the consultant job. But I said, well, you know, what's a friend for? So uh, it was nice. These are some of the pictures that I took at the time. It was uh, snowy. So it took us, you know, all five hours to make it all the way there. But uh, we got to this, uh, the, the so-called factory. The factory was not a factory, it was a house. It was a beautiful house in the countryside with uh, uh, you know, acres and acres of land around them. Around them. They had a, a, a pig. The mascot was a pig inside of the house. And so we got there and this guy that was uh, the main uh, character in the story, it was uh, uh, the, an engineer and they call it El Inge. El Inge. And turns out that um, my friend's brother-in-law, you know, Ciro Peraloca, uh, had been in school at UTEP with El Inge. They met there. And then El Inge didn't never got his degree, but he went to he went north to, to work on a factory that would produce uh, electric uh, motors. So he learned that there, how to build them. But uh, so I got there and he said, well, Jorge, first you have to sign all these forms so that uh, I can trust you. And then after that, I'm going to take you to the lab. I'm going to show you what we're doing. And then we're going to have lunch and talk about it. And let's see how it goes from there. So the plan was for me to do all of that. There was no decision. I was going to give my advice on the next day or so. And then the investors would celebrate with the guy on the next day or or so, okay. So what? What? Um, what I saw was um, it was a, 
uh, a lab. It was not a factory. It was not uh, a big uh, uh, enterprise. I have a picture. This is something like it, not exactly, but something like it. You can see that there is a disc that rotates. There is uh, uh, some magnets and there is power, you know, it's connected to electricity. And so the, the guy said, um, basically that uh, one, you need a mo motor to turn on the generator, but once the generator is, is going, you can light up a series of light bulbs and, but get one uh, of those cables and use it back to feed the electricity to the, um, to the generator. And then you can disconnect the, the original, the, the starting uh, motor. And then you can get it going on it by itself and get free energy out of that. Well, I wanted to see that. So he explained it to me. He showed me, you know, all the little details. But at some point I said, uh, can you unplug it and plug it uh, so that it runs on itself? And he began to mumble all so many weird things. Oh, we are, I'm missing the blah, blah, blah because of the blue, blue, blue. Uh, you know, a bunch of excuses. And I didn't insist because I knew that it couldn't be done. I didn't want to, you know, uh, start a fight because we hadn't had lunch. So uh, what happened then uh, was that um, we, we, we went uh, on and on uh, looking at, um, at that uh, gadget. He showed me all sorts of things. He pulled out a, a, a silver bar. It was a brick made out of pure 100% silver. And he put it next to the magnets and he showed me something and he said, well, this is not magnetic, but look at this. It, you know, a bunch of nonsense that had nothing to do with anything. Anyway, after, you know, about an hour or two of that, uh, he showed me something about the water filters and then we went to have lunch. And, but uh, the bottom line was that he couldn't make it run on its own uh, uh, energy, which makes sense. It was something like uh, the drawing that I have there on the side. It has, uh, you need an engine to make that thing, the disc rotate. And it is rotating in front of a, of a magnet. And because of that, it generates a um, differential in uh, potential and produces, a, a, if you have a, a coil, like for instance, on the top, you can, it, it, by induction, it will produce um, a, a current. So it was something like that, except that the disc was not flat, like uh, shown in the diagram. The disc had some sort of a funny shape here on, like this one that I'm showing on the right. And um, the explanation, what he told me was that, well, this is the normal thing, you know, that uh, all these uh, motors do, except that I have this design that this design is based on the cycles of water. And there we go, back to water. And because of that design, you're producing uh, vortices. And the vortices in this case are of the electric and magnetic fields. They concentrate so much energy that they pump out energy from the vacuum. So it's some sort of a, like a Casimir effect, he said. And this Casimir effect is uh, produced by means of solitons. So he was using a, a bunch of uh, scientific jargon that didn't have any meaning, but you know, I was just following, following a, a, along. And then uh, after lunch, we sat down there with the pig and everything. And the guy was, you know, um, very relaxed saying, well, you know, my findings are gonna change the world forever because we're gonna be producing so much energy. We're gonna put out, put uh, the oil companies out of business and they will stop controlling the world. Uh, politics will have no meaning because everybody's gonna have free energy. We will not need, we won't be, we won't have a need to work. And uh, the world finally is gonna be uh, enjoying peace and, so the only thing that he was missing is, oh, and I'm going to get the Nobel Prize for peace. Anyway, I didn't say any of that. Of course, I didn't. I, uh, um, I didn't want to get into a discussion. 
So, uh, we had a very good lunch, by the way. Anyway, so what happened after that was that um, we went back to the hotel. And in the hotel, I, um, my Mexican friends, they said, oh, let's go drink. They, well, no, wait, I need to write a report for you guys. So I'm going to stay here in the hotel. So I, I worked and worked and worked. And I finally found exactly the same design that he was using uh, in the, the list of patents that have been submitted to the Patent Office of the United States. There are more than 600 patents for perpetual motion machines like this one. And I found exactly the one that he was using. And so in the morning, I, these guys were ready to go and go back to the factory to sign contracts and do all that and say, wait a minute, uh, this is not going to cut it. This machine doesn't work. And it can just transmit power, the power that is getting from the motor. He can change it into induction and produce electricity, but uh, that's it. You can do better just by buying a generator that is, uh, does that. And uh, so they were uh, very happy. You can see his face because I was saving, saving him uh, $5 million. And so I, I told them not to, not to invest, keep their money, and everybody was happy. Okay, we went back to... Um, we came back to El Paso, and my friend, um, to thank me, after all, I, all my time and all my investment in gas, he took me to, to Juarez to have lunch. And his brother-in-law was there. And the brother-in-law, as you know, is, was the one that designed the filter, the water filters, but also had something to do with the design of the engraving on, these, these, uh, on the discs. And so the, the brother-in-law uh, said, uh, I'm, I'm really surprised that it didn't work. It's supposed to do this and that. And, 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 and so I asked him, why do you think that it would do that? He said, oh, because of uh, Schauberger. Schauberger was uh, a, a guy from Austria that uh, he was a hydrologist. And he began working, uh, pushing you know, um, pine trees down channels for construction. And he learned, had to learn how the water flows and all of that. So he developed all these crazy ideas that <clears throat> there are water cycles. And the water cycles had to do with the vortices and uh, the, all, all that, uh, uh, how do you call that, uh, the, the way that the rivers go, in meanders. And he said that, uh, uh, that those vortices are the key to understanding nature. And if we understand them, especially with the magnetic and electric fields, then, wow, it's going to be, you know, uh, a big event because we will be in tune with nature. So he was uh, what uh, it is nowadays called uh, biomimicry. Uh, he was trying to mimic biology which is in this case, uh, not biology, but uh, the environment, which in this case was water. And he said that um, those engravings, uh, I mean, the Brewing Law said that those engravings were, had the patterns developed by Schauberger. So, and they would, uh, because of that, they would be able to extract more energy from the vacuum. So it was, um, Uh, at that point, I said, well, you know, say no more. That is not science. That is fate. That is the Santa Fe. <laughs> and it was incredible how you can get into this uh, a new wave kind of thinking and believe it enough as to invest effort and money into doing those filters. So uh, I went home and decided to investigate this uh, Schauberger guy. And Schauberger was, he was uh, kind of a lunatic. He, he did all, one thing he did okay. He, um, a, a turbine, he invented a turbine that worked. Uh, it, we're talking about somebody that worked, uh, you know, in the, the time of the Second World War, he worked uh, for Hitler. 
Um, but uh, he also invented the repulsing, which was a flying disc that never worked, of course. And then he invented the climator. The climator was an air conditioning device that could have worked, but never. But uh, the logic was that nature was polar. You know, uh, water is polar. Polar meaning that if you have charges, they get distributed. You have positive on one end, uh, negative on the other end. And that's, uh, that allows you to form structures because uh, the, this can couple to another and another and form you know, molecules. So he said, uh, nature is polar. And because of this, we can use that to manage our forces. And our forces will eventually give us the end of war and a perfect socialism. Uh, so you can, and of course, uh, the polarity has to do with the vortices. So that, um, uh, of course, that uh, nowadays with the uh, internet, um, Schauberger has been resuscitated, just like Tesla. It's the same story as Tesla. But uh, of course, it, all it does is just uh, a conflict between, uh, you know, a funny way of thinking and scientific facts that are not such. And with this, I, I stop here. If you have questions, I can answer them. And if not, I thank you for your time. You have a question? Hello? Yes, go ahead, we can hear you. Oh, uh, hello? I'm here. Yeah, we can hear you. Go ahead with your question. I'm gonna type it in there, I apologize. Something's wrong with my, uh, yeah, I'm a student of uh, Dr. Lopez at, at UTEP. Oh, I see. <laughs> okay, so, so he says, are magnetics perpetual? Perpetual. Huh? The, the perpetual motion machine. Yeah. That's, yeah. Uh, they call it uh, perpetual mobility. That they have a, a f fancy Italian word. What it means is that once you get it going, it will be going forever and it will not require any ex uh, so extra source of energy. So that's okay. uh, one, one definition of it. Hope it makes sense. I'm sorry. I apologize. Yeah, it's kind of early in the morning. <laughs> well, thank you, sir. Yeah. I have a question about. Um, well, this doesn't really have to do with the story, but going back to your spatial trash story, do you have uh, any opinions about the monoliths that have been showing up? I don't know if you've heard about that. Uh, tell me more. Which which monolith? Uh, I, I think they've been, um, showing up. So I think there was one in California and then there's been some in other countries, like just this, uh, and I think that there was also one in Nevada. Um, I think Jorge Galeano might know more about it. Do you know what I'm talking about? The monoliths? Yeah, so just like basically metal structures in the middle of deserts, like suddenly appearing, just like the movie, this, uh, I forgot the name of the movie, I think like 2000 or something like that is the name of the movie. Mm -hmm. um, I have no idea. I, I, I never heard of that. But, um, you know, the, we are weird. I mean, we humans are weird. So you <laughs> never, never underestimate the, that. Yeah, but I'm going to check it to see what I can learn. Great. Well, thank you so much for sharing your stories with us, Dr. Lopez. And No alien uh, talks? Maybe for the next edition. We're going to hear your <laughs> alien story. <laughs> yeah. Aliens. Okay. Um, and we'll transition now to our next speaker. Um, so... I think that, uh, Jenny, you can start sharing your screen. Okay, guys, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr.